In this video, we're going to talk about descriptive statistics. And in fact, we're going to encapsulate our data in terms of a graph. Now, there are loads and loads of different types of graphs out there, and we can't look at them all. But we can look at a few important and common ones for both graphing categorical data and numerical data. The one that we're going to talk about for, or the ones that we're going to talk about for categorical data are bar graphs and pie charts. And you've probably seen them in school before. For numerical data, we're going to talk about something called a histogram, which is like a bar graph where the categories are bins of a certain width on your x-axis. So that's what we're going to do in this video. Before we start talking about categorical data, and it's kind of the same thing with histograms as well, it's a good idea to talk about a frequency table. And this is a good way of organizing your data so that you can plot it later in a nice chart. So imagine that I asked 48 people which of the following three drinks was their favorite, coffee, tea, and hot chocolate. And I kept note of what everybody said over in this area here. And if you were to do this, um, actually, you probably wouldn't write this down. You would just include it in your chart. But let's, for, for our purposes, let's say that we have this information here. Now, it's all jumbled up. You can't really see what's going on. So it's a really good idea to organize it. Organizing data is important. So let's go through and let's do this chart here. So let's talk about the different uh, columns. So we have the category column. That's all the different categories that our data can be in. We have the tally column. And this is just for kind of working. So every time we ask somebody and they say something that is in that category, then we put a little mark here. So for example, the first person's favorite drink is coffee. So I'm going to put a little mark here to say coffee. The second person's is tea. The third person is hot chocolate. The fourth person is also coffee. So put a little another mark there. The fifth person is also coffee. So these first five marks, these three and these two, represent the first five people in our list. Now, before we talk about frequency and relative frequency, let's fill out the tally bit of this frequency table. So pause the video and try it yourself and see if you get the same thing. So pause the video now. Okay, so we're back. And we see, after putting some little tally marks here, we can easily count this. I grouped them in five. That's kind of an easy way of doing it. We have five, 10, 15, 20, 23 coffee drinkers. So the frequency column just contains the number in that category. So the frequency of coffee drinkers, that's 23. There are 23 coffee drinkers. Tea drinkers, we can check that we tallied up 17. And hot chocolate drinkers, there were 8. So 23 people liked coffee the best out of these three drinks. 17 liked tea the best. And 8 liked hot chocolate. And in the total column, don't worry about the total column for tallies. We can just put an X through that or nothing. Um, but we can total this and we get 23 plus 17 plus 8 is 48. And that makes sense. There are indeed 12 times 4, 48 um, data points in our sample here. That's great. And now for the relative frequency, you can think of this... If you like, another way of thinking about the relative frequency is the proportion. Or if you like, you could express it as a percentage. Either is fine. So in the first column, or the first row, sorry, there are 23 coffee drinkers. So the frequency is 23. And the relative frequency, well, it's 23 out of 48 total, which is 
47.9%, or 0.479 if you'd rather express it just as a proportion. And similarly, for the others, we have 35.4% of our sample are tea drinkers, and 16.7% of our sample like hot chocolate the best. And of course, the total column, let's add these up. And you can check, indeed, that we do get exactly 100%. I do want to make a quick note here. So let me make that note. So you might be, might differ. And just slightly, depending on what you're rounding to, it'll differ slightly. from what it actually is, 100% due to rounding. But I do mean slightly. You could imagine, just because of rounding, you could imagine having an extra tenth here of a percent, but you wouldn't be off by like 5% or something like that. So it's only, it would only differ very, very slightly from 100% because of rounding. And that is a frequency table. And now we're going to use this frequency table to create a bar chart or a bar graph and a pie chart of this categorical data. And notice that this is categorical data. It's nothing that we're, these categories aren't things we count or measure. They are just bins that people go in, either the coffee bin, the tea bin, or the hot chocolate bin. The first type of graph we're going to talk about is indeed a bar graph for categorical data. And we'll draw one in a second, given the data that we just had. But it's good when you want to compare absolute numbers in categories. We want to see the absolute difference between the number of, say, hot chocolate drinkers and tea drinkers and coffee drinkers. And we'll talk about this once we uh, see an example. But there's two, three real keys to a, good, to a good bar graph. You want to make sure that the bars are equally spaced apart. You want to make sure that the bars themselves are the same width. And you want to make sure that the y-axis is unbroken, that you're not kind of starting halfway up because then you don't really get a good picture of what's going on. And we'll see these just in a second. Okay, so here we have our bar graph. I just want to point out, I just rewrote a smaller version of our frequency table here. So 23 people picked coffee, 17 picked tea, and 8 picked hot chocolate of their favorite drink of the three. So you can see I have our different categories down here, and the height of each bar corresponds to how many people shows that. So here, if we go over the hot chocolate, we can see that the bar is at height 8 here. 
So let me just go over here. I'll draw something like this just so you can kind of see it. So that's an 8. And similarly, if we went over here, we'd have 23. And here we'd get 17. And I do want to point out a few things. So it's a good idea to keep some space between the categories so they don't look all bunched together. So they look like totally different categories that are not related to each other at all. Once we get into histograms, which is a way of kind of turning numerical data into something like a bar graph, we'll want our bars touching because it's breaking up the x-axis in some numerical way. But here to say ah, this area actually means nothing, we're going to have some space between our bars, which is great. The second thing I want to talk about is making sure that the bars are of equal width. Let me erase a bit of this and let me change it. So let me change this last bar to not have the width that it does. Let's have it have a larger width. So let's say the width is now, let's do something like that. The height is still the same, but the width is larger than the other two bars. So here, when our eye looks at this, our eye is seeing kind of the area of the bars and not just the height of them. So we see that the area of hot chocolate is actually quite big. It's probably bigger than T here. So we're kind of tricking our brain to think that, hey, the number of hot chocolate drinkers and the number of tea drinkers is probably about the same, when in actuality, that isn't true. We wanted the bars to have the same width so that we're kind of not including that second dimension in our understanding of what's happening. We only really care about the height and not the area of it overall, so we keep one dimension fixed. And the last thing I wanted to talk about very quickly is making sure that we have an unbroken y-axis. And I'll just do a little small kind of chart to see why that's the case. So look at this left-hand graph here. So here we have an unbroken x-axis, starts at zero, and let's say this is 10,000 and this is 9,500. We have three categories, doesn't matter what this represents, but imagine there are 10,000 people in the red category and about 9,500 in the green category, and in between is the blue category. In this graph on the left, where the axis isn't broken, you can see that it looks like there's almost the same amount of people in all three categories. There's a little bit more in, um, in the red category, but not that much more. These categories have roughly the same amount of people in them. But if we're a little unscrupulous and we want to hide that fact and we want to say, oh, there's way more people in the red category than the green category, maybe we wouldn't start at the y-axis at zero. Maybe we'd start somewhere like 9,000 or 9,500, somewhere like that. And now this really amplifies the difference. It looks like the red category is much bigger than the green category. Now, sometimes it's unavoidable. Sometimes the data is very close to each other and you do want to highlight those differences. And if you must break the y-axis, make sure that you tell people you're doing that. Put a little squiggle line there. That little squiggly line says you're breaking the y-axis. Try and do that as little as possible because you want to be accurate with your graphs. You want them to show the entire picture. And now, let's look at our data in a different way. Let's look at it as a pie chart. Okay, so a pie chart basically is really good for comparing the relative size of groups. If you're not concerned about the difference of actual numbers, you're more concerned with the difference of the proportion of each group, then a pie chart is a really good way of showing this. So the whole idea is that you're going to have slices of the pie, and the size of the slices is in proportion to the relative frequency of 
the category. So let's kind of figure that out. So our first slice, well, we need to figure out the correct angle. Let's do coffee first. So the size of the coffee slice, we want it to be 23 40 eighths of our circle. And if we want to solve this by hand, well, we can figure out the angle. An entire circle is 360 degrees, and we want to solve for the number of degrees that's in the same proportion. So we can just solve this little proportion equation here. 23 in our category, 48 whole, equals however many degrees over 360 whole. And we solve that, and we find that x is 172.5 degrees. So, and again, if, you're, if you forget how to solve these, a good idea is cross-multiplying and then solving for x. That's a good way of going. So, we could get our protractor, and, but I'm just going to kind of do it. I'm going to eyeball it. I know half a circle is 180 degrees. But just for our purposes, let's say this angle here is 172.5 degrees. And I'll color that. We colored that in red last one, last time for the bar graph. So we'll do the same thing. This will be our coffee slice. Great. And we can do a similar thing for the size of the slice for tea drinkers and for hot chocolate drinkers. And there is our completed pie chart, figuring out the angle for the sector for, of tea drinkers and the angle of the sector for hot chocolate drinkers. And it's kind of easy to see here that the number of coffee drinkers is about half of the people surveyed. And hot chocolate drinkers is quite a bit less, so it's really easy to compare sizes of groups this way. Pie charts are great for that. And of course, you could give it a title, something close to the same title that we gave our bar graph. And there we have bar graphs and pie charts for categorical data. In the next video, we'll talk about histograms, which is a chart for numerical data.